thank you and bless your holy name. We thank you for another day that you brought us here together. As you have declared that your children should gather together in your presence. We pray that today, O oh Lord, you bring forth your word in a way that it will touch each and every one at his or her place, Father, of need, O oh Lord. That your word will take its impact, Father, that it will not just be something which goes out and not have any effect, but rather, Lord, that it will be part of us to help us in our growth and our life with Christ Jesus. We bless your name. Amen. Amen. Um, today, uh, my main theme is thinking bib biblically, but I'll concentrate mainly on authority and the sufficiency of scripture. Um, I, was, I was preparing that um, something, there were some incidents that I faced recently, and I thought it's going to fit in nicely. And what I'm going to talk about the sufficiency and the um, authority of scripture. There's one thing which most of the time is lacking, and that is the context. So I want to bring some two examples of what I encountered recently. So that will bring the context in view first before I go to the main topic. Um, one of them was something which one would have said it was positive or is positive. Actually, someone was um, on the talk show radio trying to justify or trying to say that homosexualism is bad. And the person went in and picked Leviticus 18.22. Um, don't put it on, I'll, I'll read it. It says, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And the guy tries to justify everything. And here what was missing was the context. And the person at the opposing side also said, okay, if we are going to quote Leviticus 18.22, Turn to Leviticus 25, 44. And what he said was, As for your male and female slaves, whom you, have, you may have, you may buy male and female slaves from among the nations that are around you. So the guy asked him now, I'm in America. Should I buy slaves from Canada or Mexico? Because that's what the word of God is saying here, as we are quoting Leviticus to me. Then he went further on and said, okay, now, turn to Exodus 21, 7. It says, when a man sells his daughter as a slave, he shall not go out as male slaves do. If she does, not, no, I won't, I'll leave it further. Then the question they asked was, so I want to sell my daughter, so what is the price that I should send? Because the word of God says that when you sell the slave. So what is missing here? What is missing here is context. The context of the Messages which were here in Leviticus was God talking to Israel that when they go to the, the land they were going to, what they had to do. That is not what is applicable to us now as Christians. If you want to defend the Bible, we have to use, look at the whole Bible in the framework. And even if you want to start, you start from the New Testament and that order. So that is one important lesson that we should be careful when we are trying to um, justify what the Bible is saying and then take it out of context because the people in the world, some of them also know what is in the Bible. And one problem that I always say is um, if you pick any passage from the Bible, you can use it. If you want to justify anything, you can get a passage in the Bible to justify anything you want. And the reason why it happens is because we lose focus of the context. And normally context, we have the immediate context. That is what I would say is the most important. But we have the bigger one and the global one. The global one as a Christian, the context is supremacy of God and the will of God. That is the real umbrella that you have to look at the whole thing. When it comes to each um, book that you want to read, 
you also have to have a view of what is the context, what is the person trying to bring out, what is it, that is the, the bigger context also, which is the self of God's, um, below God's supremacy. Then whatever passage you are going to pick also, look at the context also very well. What is it talking about? Because otherwise you can pick something like a catchphrase and you can spin it around any way you want. And other people also know the word of God at least. Even if it's they are using the carnal mind, they can square you up accordingly. The second thing that I, had, I, I got, this was between me and somebody. That person sends messages here and then. I've been telling the person that some of the messages he's sending is not right. But then he sent something and he said, it goes something like this. Um, that if you're a Christian, whatever you want, you keep on saying it, repeating it, repeating it, and you are going to have it. And then one phrase that came out is, says, as for you children of light, it doesn't matter your present status. Keep on declaring it, and it will be yours. And then I responded to the guy and said, oh, that, in fact, as far as the Bible is concerned, the whole counsel of God is what is important. Um, but if you twist scriptures, you can use it to say anything. But I want to ask him one question here. Now he is saying that keep on saying it, that's how you build your faith, how you get your thing to happen. He should look at Abraham. God told Abraham that um, he will be a father of many nations. It took, I use the word 20 years, I think probably it's 40, I may be wrong. It's 40, right? 20, okay. I said for over 20 years, can you imagine Abraham every day, morning, afternoon, evening, declaring, I'm the father of many nations? He wouldn't do that. He would rest in the word of God and he would be very comfortable. So if you pray and you have faith, you don't keep on declaring stuff. You trust in the word of God and you'll be relaxed. And then his response was bad. But let me, let me read it. If that works for you, then you're entitled to your opinion and those who follow such faithless teachings and perspective of the scripture. Then, you see here, I didn't send you a message. You sent me a message. I responded, now it's actually keeping my opinion. Then why do you send it to me at all? Well, then he continued, I teach what I experienced by the power of the Holy Ghost. Oh, how the Pharisees and the Sadducees miss it and could not understand any issue Jesus was teaching. Then he quoted Matthew 16, 6, King James, New King James Version. Jesus said to them, watch and beware of the living of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then he continued, you exhibit the same characteristics and I find it to be so pitiful. I'm sorry to say this, but your insistence on faithless practices baffles me and have no room to entertain that. So you might as well consider your position while you still have time. Under normal circumstances, I should have gone on a tangent, but for some reason, I was calm. I, I responded, I'm going to read it so that it comes out. I said, my purpose is to point out syncretism that I have seen. And what I expect is for you to do soul session and see really if the teachings are you are espousing are biblical. If you do genuine investigation and you find them biblical, then by all means continue practicing them. Not that I don't know the teachings and the doctrines of the message coming from you. But the more I study the Bible and the practices from such places as Hinduism, New Age, occult, Buddhism, New Thought, Gnosticism, and others, I see a lot of syncretism not in line with the Bible. Bear in mind that methods from these worldviews I've just mentioned, they work at least to some extent. So it is worth noting that if something works, that doesn't make it okay for a Christian. And the old, new, old adage still goes, not all that glitters is gold. And then he, he came back. So the problem I find with your criticism is the sheer unbelief and lack of faith. 
That is what Pharisees and the Sadducees were doing to Jesus Christ. And the Bible says the kingdom of God is likened us unto children. And if you cannot receive the word of God with the childlike faith and believe this, then it will be very difficult for you to walk in faith. Clearly, Jesus is right in that it is difficult for a rich man or the supposed learned to enter the kingdom of God. As, for, uh, as it is for a camel to go through the needle of the eye, it is this type of unbelief that I don't have time to tolerate and cannot be part of it. Pure faith in the word of God works for me and countless others. So at this time, it looks like my, my thing changed. The first one was following Solomon's um, advice that if you are talking to somebody, a foolish person, don't respond in his foolish way. So that was my first advice. Now I said, well, and the next verse, Solomon also said that if you don't respond to the foolish person in his foolish ways, he'll be consigned in his own ways. So this is what I said. I said, if you're a Christian, your duty is to proclaim the word of God and leave the Holy Spirit to do the rest. You can't expect me to believe what you've said. Leave the Holy Ghost. But now, because you're espousing something that I consider not biblical, you refer to me as a Pharisee or a Sadducee. To let this is a tip, to me, this is a typical twist of scripture. When one quotes without context or out of context. Now, I'm going to use the same method. That's what I said, the hermeneutics that we are using. So can I call you a worker of iniquity? After all, in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Jesus refers to people who thought they were doing miracles and wonders, that they are workers of iniquity. We are using some similar methods, so can I call you a worker of iniquity? Then I went and I said, if I go to Galatians also, Galatians 1, 8, Paul says that if an angel from heaven should preach to you, or a gospel contrary to the same which I have preached, let the person be accursed. So can I call you accursed in this sense? That is the question that I asked him. And I said, but you know what? I'm not going to do that. That is the job for, for God. He is the one who is going to decide. And then I went on. I said, now let's come back to the immediate issue at hand. Where, is the, where in the Bible are we told in context that we can keep on saying things what we want and we eventually we'll get it? Can I start and say now, I will not die physically, keep on saying it throughout my life, and I'll live forever. I don't see that in the Bible. You don't find it in church history either. But I can trace the source where it entered to current Christianity, because that is something that some people espouse. And I went on, I said, you just pick any fundamental new thought book, and that is their fundamental principle. That's how this system entered into our world here, or into Christianity. Yes. Then I went again, probably that was, I was a bit mad. I said, don't think you are the only one who has the Spirit of God in you to proclaim what you are doing. The objective of a Christian is the Bible. The Bible is the standard. Any idea that comes out, you have to test it according to the Bible. And if you meet messages which are not in line with the Bible, you do not follow it. Biblical discernment demands that we test all things, take what is good and abstain from what is evil or any form of evil. You cannot hide under the umbrella of faith and expect one to accept a message without discernment. It, it has to be tested. If one does not accept the message, because it fails the biblical test, you cannot pull the Pharisee card. <laughs> so that is where the conversation went back. The point is, if you look at the whole thing, he started, he gave a message. I disputed the message that he was giving. And instead of probably trying to tell me, well, you have to prove your case, he went straight and started with accusation, accusation, and what did he do? He just pulled something out of the Bible without context. That's, that is a Pharisee. And the place he, he quoted 
let's look at it. Um, I think that is Matthew 6, 16, 1 to 12. Let's look at what is in there. I'm starting from um, 1 because I don't want to quote only the place that he quoted because otherwise you miss the picture. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees came and to test him. And they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, you shall say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be fair weather. Today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Which one is my ESV? That's what I want to read. The bottom one is the ESV. Okay, all right. <laughs> go, go on. Uh, let's move to the verse 4. An evil and an evil and idolatrous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to them except the sign of Jonah. For he has left them and departed. Uh, so he left them and departed. Okay. When the disciples read the other sign, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, Watch and beware of the leaving of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they began discussing among themselves, saying, We brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of, of this, said, Oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourself the fact that we have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves? And the 5,000 and many baskets we gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the living of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Okay, I think, yeah, the, the next one. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the living of bread, but the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So if we look at this, looking at it in context, that is trying to quote, what were the Pharisees doing? They were the teachers of the day. They knew the Bible in and out, at least the Old Testament. Those guys, some of them could recite it from A to Z for you, as if like Paul and others. But then when they saw all the signs that Jesus was doing, which was supposed to authenticate that he is the Messiah, what were they doing? They were still looking for a sign. So Jesus was telling them that there will be no sign given to them except the sign of Jonah, meaning that when he died and he resurrected. And he was warning his disciples that they should be careful of the Pharisees, what they teach. So how do you apply this to the message that a person brought to me? That yes, if you want anything to happen, you have to keep on saying anything is going to happen. And I say it doesn't work like that. And I was citing Abraham to point out something, and he, he just said, oh, if I don't agree with him, then I'm what? I so this is where Pharisee. See, that is one of misquoting, quoting things out of context. We should try and avoid that, because when you do that, for instance, if you do that to a non-Christian, you are rather driving the person completely away from God. We have to be genuine and put things in, in context. And if I should mention a little bit, because I said that I know where the teaching is coming from. The teaching which says that you can keep on saying what you want it to happen. The logic goes something like this. That when God created heaven and earth, he said, and it happened. So if we are created in the image of God, we also have to say, and it happened. One thing that we've forgotten that we are not God. God is omnipotent. He creates things out of nothing. We cannot create things out, out of nothing. Even if you say something that is going to work, if it's going to work, God is the one who will make it work. Like Lamentation, he said that who can declare a thing and it will happen unless the Lord has something like allowed it. So, which means even what we are declaring is useless unless it is in line with him. We are not God. And then some of them also try to use um, 
that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Where is that? Hebrews? Yeah, Romans 10. Let's look at it. Romans 10, 14 to 7. But I'll start from 14 because that phrase is, it says, here Paul was preaching and then he was telling how unbelievers will come to Christ. So he said, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him on whom they have not he never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all ob obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what we have, he has heard from us. Okay. So faith comes by from hearing and hearing through the word of God. Let's stop here. So we see that he's, he has started with his soul. So what is his argument? All that he's saying is, if somebody will have to come to Christ, come to faith, he has to hear the word of God. That is all that it is. It doesn't tell you that if you want to have faith, you have to keep on saying what you are, you are saying, and then you are going to get a faith. That is not the whole line of argument of Paul. He says that so, if you look at it, if somebody is going to hear and believe God, the person has to hear the word of God. And to hear the word of God, somebody has to do it. And that somebody must be somebody who has been sent. But then if you take only this phrase, you can spin it around any way you want. And then you can let it mean anything at all. Um, so some people keep on saying that you can pick anything out of the Bible and then make it represent anything you want, so long as it agrees with what you are looking for. So in the Bible, we don't pick our ideas and try to validate with the Bible. We look at the Bible and see whether it agrees with what our conceived perception or idea. So this is a lesson. I've, some time ago, I preached about um, looking at the Bible in context. And I said, somebody said, context is everything, um, which is a, a hyperbole. Not like, but he says context is everything. And he put it as, as, as scripture out of context is a pretext, something like that. So we have to be careful when we are studying the Bible, we look at it in context. That's why Paul told Timothy that he should study to show himself approved, the word of God, that is to be a workman who is not ashamed of it, meaning that you have to look at the whole counsel of God. That is what is important. So now that I'm going to talk about the supremacy and sufficiency of Scripture, I brought this in because I don't want anybody to consider it as you just go and pick a verse and s stick on it and say that's what the word of God is saying. Look at it in context. At least, if nothing at all, two or three verses above and below will give you a very good picture of what the Bible is talking about, what the argument is all about, or what God is trying to tell us. Is that is very important. So, now I'm going to go to the sufficiency of scriptures, but I want to start with worldview. And the worldview is what detects our thinking and everything we do. So people try to de define worldview as um, a collection of presuppositions, convictions, and values from which a person tries to understand and make sense out of the world. So all that it means is the fundamental principles that we are going to use to determine how things work. And the mathematicians will tell us, uh, upon, it says, the a priori principle, those are the things that, those that you assume that they are valid before you move on. And what is going to happen is, <coughs> if you get that wrong, everything will be wrong. The conclusions that you come to will all be wrong. So as a Christian, what should be our worldview? What should be our starting point? Um, someone mentioned that the Christian, as a Christian, our worldview is to see and understand God as the creator and his creation. So the first thing that we have to look at is we have to look at what God is saying, what God has said, what God is revealing to us. And here the person who understand God 
and his creation because he was also bringing out um, the idea that it's not we can know a lot of stuff from the universe, okay, from the creation itself. I think um, here, what has happened to my technology? <laughs> okay. Here, the thinking of, of that person was if you look at the universe, it can tell you a, a lot about God. And there was a, a time that Paul mentioned that we become corrupted just because we see the universe, the creation of God, and the things that God has done, and the revelation which he has given us, but we do not honor God. And because of that, God has given us to depraved mind. I wish I could quote it as exactly for you. I have it there, but when I read it, I'll, I'll quote it again. So, as for a Christian, our starting point of everything is from God and his truth. That is the way we have to start it. If we do not start it from there, we are going to make a lot of mistakes. And particularly when we face things which seem to be challenging the word of God, we are going to easily back off. And Peter put it nicely, and that is Second Peter 1, 2 to 4. Let's look at it. So may the grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So here what Peter is pointing out to us is everything that we need to lead our life comes from the word of God. That comes from what God has said. So for the Christian, um, the Bible alone contains all that we need to know about our spiritual life and how to live godly. And this one, it says, it comes through the knowledge of God. And that is the most important. The most important knowledge of God is the one which he has declared in his word. Um, even when it comes to evangelism, we should be very careful when we preach thinking that we are the ones really going to convert people. But the truth of the matter is, it's not us who are going to do that. Ours is just to proclaim the word of God. Like I read that um, in Romans, it says, a sender has to go and proclaim the word of God, and faith will come. And we know that the faith is granted by the Holy Ghost. He is the one going to do it. So, a personal faith, we know that it's a gift from the Holy Ghost. All that we need to do is proclaim the word of God. And we have to move from the principle that what God says is what is true. And what God says, um, we have to look at it. What is God telling us? Not what a phrase that we have seen in the Bible. That is not what we look at. We look at what God is saying. And Jeremiah also tries to tell us exactly um, the point of view, the worldview that we should look at things. Let's look at Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24. Um, 23. He says, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord the Lord. So, what is God saying here? That everything as a Christian that we do, we have to look at it to know the Lord. That is the starting point. If our desire is to know the Lord, our worldview will be in the right direction because God will be the foundation. The basic assumption is God is who he says he is. What he has declared to be is what counts so that we follow from it. And as human beings, things will move in that direction. I think yesterday there was an interesting discussion 
about the mind. If human being as we are, the most important thing that God has given us to work in his direction is to use the mind, irrespective of what you are going to process it. Um, a typical example that I cited was Abraham was told to go and sacrifice Isaac. And in Hebrews, we know that he did that faithfully. But Hebrews told us how he managed to do that. And what does Hebrews say? He says, Abraham considered God, that God is able to raise his child from death, even if he killed him. So he had to, I use the word, rationalize it. He had to use what? His brain. So human beings as it is, if we are going to do anything, irrespective of where it's coming from, even if it's coming from your spirit, it has to go through your mind before the action of the body will take place. So the mind becomes very, very important. So God says here, what we have to do is we have to understand him. We should not be boastful about things that we have or we have made. After all, Paul says that what do you have that you have not received? Everything that we are and we have, God has given it to us. But God says that what we should boast about what we should be proud about is if we really understand and know him. And that if we know him, we should know that these are the principles that he delights in. And that is steadfast love, justice, and righteousness on earth. So these are the things that the Lord um, delights in. And that should be our starting point. Our starting point, again, I repeat, knowing that God is God. He has created everything. And what he has told us about himself and what we can get from the creation, that is what we have to look at. Although we know that things from creation is not enough to give us salvation, yet still, God has said that even if you do not hear anything from him, looking at creation alone should be able to make you wonder and know that, wow, who has put up this magnificent universe over there? And that alone should let you praise him, should let, him know, should let us know that yes, there's someone beyond um, the universe who has done that. If we go with um, the theories um, like um, which says that um, all that there is is the universe and there's nothingness, that the world will create it itself and we go through the Big Bang and try to say that there's nobody behind and looking at all the designs which has gone into it to get the universe going, um, we're going to miss it. God says that if we do that, what does he do? He will leave us to our depraved mind and we end up doing things which uh, we human beings ought not to do. But that is what comes. Okay, so now from the worldview, um, okay, I may touch here a little bit and we'll, we'll, we'll end here because no matter, I don't want to go beyond um, 11.45, otherwise they'll push the service too far. What I want us to look at is the sufficiency of scriptures. Here, we must be convinced that God himself has spoken in scripture. If we don't have this conviction, um, we will not be able to obey or follow what God has declared. So Christ, as Christians, we should be committed that the Bible is inerrant, as somebody would say, it is authoritative word of God, which we should use as a blueprint for our lives. Um, Jesus put it in nicely. He says that, um, for truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a jot, will pass from the law until it is accomplished. What Jesus is referring to the law here is the word of God at, at his time as he was there in um, the Old Testament. So what he's trying to say is what is important is the word of God. You can trust it. So he tries to, I always say that Jesus normally talks in the hyperbole to bring the message across. So he's trying to tell that not even a little dot of it will pass away, meaning that he's trying to bring the idea that things will be fulfilled. And he also went on to say that he's the one who has fulfilled it. So the idea that is coming out is we have to trust the word of God. We have to be sure, we have to be confident that what he says is what goes. That is what is reality, if I can put it that way, that the word of God becomes very, very important. The scripture should be the standard that we must use to test every other truth claim, just like what happened between me and the other guy. Um, unless we use the scripture, we are going to miss it. And the scripture as it is, 
the best thing is we should have the broad picture and then that is A to Z to be able to see things out. If we don't do that, we miss a lot. Um, it doesn't come one day we have to start from somewhere and throughout our lives try to make sure that at least you'll be able to go through the Bible uh, from end to end. You will get a, big, a bigger picture of what is going on, what God is looking at. Um, you may miss some things, but it doesn't matter. So long as you keep on studying and learning, you keep on improving. And always what I say is, if you had a different mis misconception, and you come to realize that that thinking was wrong, the only thing is you change and you move on. The only other caution is make sure that you are really convinced that the old idea is not right. And the one that you get convinced of it, then you can change and move on. Until then, I wouldn't advise anybody to just change. Make sure you go back and be like the Bereans, as Paul was saying. Go back, look at it, and make sure whether what you really thought of or thinking of is the right way. If it's not, look at the Bible to see what is the right way, and then take that with it, and then move on. Um, you can talk to God to forgive you. God will forgive you. But one thing is, God is also patient, and he knows where everybody is. So at times, even if we are doing certain things wrong, he still responds nicely to us so that we can move on. And as we know that as a Christian, or anyone who has come to know Christ, the end will be when you die. Um, the theologians call it sanctification. The purpose of it is we keep on striving towards the word of God on and on and on until the end um, of your life. <laughs> There's also another thing that we have to remember. That Christian ethics, as it is, um, doesn't make a worldview. Um, if you look at, there are a lot of things which ethically are good that we do here. And other people who don't believe in God, they do the same thing. So the ethics is not what is important. The most important is your personal relationship with God. And in that sense, your personal relationship with Christ. That is what is important here. That is what we have to look at. Um, we also should be able to affirm that what the Bible says about itself is true, and what the Bible says about the world is what is really true. And that is what is reality. For God sees the end from the beginning. He knows everything we do not. So we should trust what God says. And then when we move from that perspective, everything will move on fine. Um, I will not continue our edit here and I'll deal with the rest um, next week. I think next week I'm still preaching. So we'll do that. And then there I'll bring a psalm which David described nicely what the word of God should be. And it's a beautiful thing if you, you, you look at it critically. So I'm going to end here and say that one thing that we have to be careful as Christians is we always need to read the word of God in context. Secondly, as we read the word of God in context, we should be assured of um, what God says he is. Our starting point should be that what God has declared is the truth, and that is what is important, so that we move from there, so that when any other idea comes, we have to go and check with the truth. And the objective truth that we have is the word of God. If you cannot find it in the word of God or um, if I say cannot find it in the word of God, I just don't mean a phrase which somebody will pull out and say, oh, you see this phrase, that's what it means. If they give you the phrase, go and read it all over. There's one that I used to make an example of a lot. That there is a verse which says, don't touch my anointed, do my prophet no harm in the Old Testament. With this phrase alone, you would think that you cannot challenge somebody who calls himself, in quotes, a man of God. But go back and look at it. The anointed in that Old Testament was Israel. God was saying that, I told Egypt, don't touch my anointed. Who is the anointed? That is Israel. And then again, don't touch my prophet. Who is the prophet? Who is Moses? So if we are looking at this and we want to translate it to us, we have to be very careful. Are we the anointed? As Israel, if we are Israel, then what it means is every Christian is. So that phrase that we hear around, don't touch my anointed, is completely 
are being misused. And again also, um, don't touch my prophet. What did God say? We are kings and priests and whatnot, which means it also applies to every Christian. When people try to do that, what they are trying to do is they are trying to shut you from um, um, opposing them in that sense. And there is a biblical principle that Paul always insisted. Test all things. Take what is good and desist from every form of evil that we should bear in mind. And that is in line with the word of God. That is what God is telling us that we should do. Everything that comes out, every idea, every theory that comes out, go back and see whether it agrees with the word of God. And don't pick a phrase that they send it on. Or look at the whole Bible, the whole context, and see whether that is indeed what God is telling us. Um, I'll end here. And I wanted to make a surprise for somebody. Is um, is it here? OJ, yeah, I, 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 I gave him a promise that normally when I finish preaching, I want somebody to pray. So God will help us in our lives. And I said I was going to pick on him because he prayed at our meeting and I was so impressed. So OJ, today that it, it will be you to pray for us. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, my heart is beating fast. <laughs> 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 but I hope you're blessed like I was blessed. I was, I was really blessed because um, it's important to look at the word in context because we can miss a lot of things. And I'll, uh, I'll, just, I'll just pray. Um, Father, thank you for the word of God. Father, thank you for, oh God, Pastor Jesse, who has insisted, oh God, on contextual reading of the word. I thank you, O oh God, because at the, this is the end times, and there are many things that are happening. Many people out there who are preaching on online, social media, and they're telling us all kinds of things, O oh God. Father, I pray, O oh God, that you have it, O oh God. Let, instill it in our heart to see the necessity of this, that we should look at the word, O oh God, in context, that we should see the word and try, O oh God, to have the mind to understand the word for what you are saying, and not just what sounds good for us at the moment. Father, I pray, O oh God, that you, O oh God, move our hearts, move our hearts, O oh God, as we are looking into the word, that we we'll look at it, O oh God, and just look up to you, look only up to you, as yes, this God. is your word, and this is what yes. you want yes. us, O oh God, to do yes. in our life. This your word is, O oh God, the standard, and is a thing, O oh God, that we, what we have to look up to through our lives, through our every situation, through our lives, O oh God. Father, I pray, O oh God, that you hold it in our hearts, that we we'll hold, we'll hold ourselves accountable, O oh God, to read the word and understand it for what what you are saying and for what you are not saying as well because we understand the word sometimes oh god for things that are just good for us but oh god help us to understand the word oh god according to the time when it was written at that time when it was written what were you saying that will have it in our hearts when we read the word and oh god will relate it to ourselves now according to your will and your plan for our lives i pray in the name of jesus christ that you do this oh god help us oh god let your holy spirit guide us oh god direct us oh god as we look into the word that your holy spirit we oh god direct us and guide us accordingly in the mighty name of jesus christ i pray amen, amen.